so this is an experiment. We've, we've never co-presented, so you'll be our guinea pigs. And, uh, and I hope everyone did have some coffee because this is uh, not the most exciting topic, if we're honest. Um, so we heard a little bit earlier about domain names in court. And we want to talk a little bit about keeping um, So we thought we'd, we'd try something new and, uh, and start off with an analogy to football. So we understand there's some CCTLD registries and, and domain name registrants in the audience. And so for us, we thought about as the registry, you are there really to sell names is, is one of your functions. So we thought you have sold a domain name, you have a, a, a star player, you have a star asset, a valuable domain name that's been purchased and it's being used uh, for, for whatever website content or, or commercial use. Uh, the, the registrants putting it to. So in the beginning, you're there in the back end, the domain name sold, everything's going according to plan, there's no issues. And um, as Brian is saying, your registrant is very happy with the services that you provide. The registrant is also very happy with how things are going, the business, the, the domain name, the website, everyone's happy, everyone's smiling. Su and success. the relationship continues, uh, things are going well, there's some goals scored, maybe there's some resales on, on the aftermarket, and, and everyone's happy. But then, of course, we know sometimes reality sets in. And sometime, sometimes things happen, and things that are not expected, or things that you're not thinking about, that you're not worried about as a registrant. And so, uh, an innocent dispute goes from bad to worse, and then the question comes up. Do you pull out the red card so as a registry or as a registrar? Yeah, so the question is really, as, as the registry, do you need to be involved? Do you, do you need to be officiating disputes between registrants and, and IP owners? Do you need to, to step in and, and pull out the red card and, and take the domain name registration away from, from a misbehaving registrant? Well, for us, the answer is clear. The answer is no. You can sit back and watch this from afar. So I don't know if the, if the screenshot really demonstrates this, but this is seeing the, the referee coming in from, uh, from a TV from afar. So this is where we come in. We, we provide a service where you as the registry can sit back and watch the disputes unfold without actually having to get involved in them directly. Exactly, and, uh, and as Brian is mentioning, the, the way the WIPO Center is involved is basically you as a registry, if you're a CCTLD registry, or in the cases of, uh, of registrars um, and GTLDs uh, mainly, um, you outsource you know, the, the dispute basically. You don't have to deal with the problem, but um, the problem basically, the, the outsource, uh, you know, what the center looks into in the terms of dispute, the types of disputes simply relate to trademark matters. Or they do not go to issues such as copyright or criminal activity, such as the ones that uh, Elizabeth pre previously was talking to us about. And maybe before looking at, at some of the registration trends, we should situate a little bit for you uh, where we are within WIPO and, and more generally. So we sit in the Arbitration and Mediation Center. Both Francisco and I work in a section called the Internet Dispute Resolution Section. And as part of the Arbitration and Mediation Center, really we're focused on providing services to both our member states and to IP owners and businesses globally to help them resolve disputes outside of the courts. So we understand courts are there. Uh, they can be there, as we heard earlier, sometimes for injunctive relief or where damages are sought, but we think there's a value in providing dispute resolution services outside of the courts. It traditionally is a lot faster, uh, it's, it's a lot cheaper, and it also occurs on a, on a global scale. So in the very early days of domain name registrations taking on commercial value, you had uh, registrants situated in a different jurisdiction than the trademark owner, and that created all sorts of hurdles for, for brand owners and registrants trying to look at which court do they enforce their rights in, which court has jurisdiction over this. So along came in 1999 a recommendation from WIPO for 
the UDRP, which manages this on a global scale. And since then, a number of CCTLDs have either adopted the UDRP or variants, and we'll look into uh, the specific variants more in just a little bit. And I think it's also important to note that um, of the total number of millions of registrations, on this slide you see the total number of CCTLD registrations in comparison to the total number of registrations worldwide, is that while you continue to do business, while people continue to register domain names and do business through domain names, and is that the disputes that actually that the center has administered, actually in total together with other providers when we're talking about the UDIP, represents only a zero, zero point zero zero two percent of the total numbers of registrations. So just because a, um, you inf inform a registrant that there is going, or a registry that adopting a policy means that this, uh, the, the problem will be outsourced, in this case to WIPO, does not mean that every registration will end up in a, you know, in a UDRP complaint filed with the, with the center. Yeah, and I, I think that's really that's really the key of, of what we want to relay here. Is we know there there are some people from different CCTLDs here, and, and really uh, the service we provide is outsourcing that dispute resolution function of not having to be involved. And we know that um, CCTLDs are increasingly important today. We see increased numbers of disputes with us. We also see uh, increased registrations. You see, I'm, I'm sure you're all very familiar with these types of statistics where um, some of the CCTLDs are actually out competing some of the GTLDs. Yeah, well, and then when you look at the total number of CCTLDs, well, the top 10 CCTLDs account for 67% of total CCTLD registrations. So while the numbers are high, it is true that the top 10% are also represent a, a very important uh, number. Now, um, as Brian previously mentioned, we do provide uh, services for, uh, for the reason that he stated, but to go back into the reason as to why it is that we do what we do, one has to go back to the year 2000, when the, C the WIPO CCTLD program was established. So basically, this was a member states requesting that the WIPO, in this case the center, look into um, registration matters and the possibilities of CCTLDs adopting dispute mechanisms such as the UDRP. And so since then, the center has been provided, providing technical advice and also policy advice to CCTLDs. And whereas in the year 2000, the total numbers of disputes administered by the center with respect to the total numbers of cases administered uh, by the center represented only 1%. Today, that number is, has grown up to 13, 14%. And really, the, the, the core of this is that when the UDRP was developed, um, no one really knew how it was going to work, if it was going to work. Now here we are 15 years later. It's worked very well. It's kept over 50,000 cases out of court, um, and it's, it's by doing that, it's effectively acted as a safe harbor for not only registrants who don't have to go to court to face monetary damages, but for also registries and registrars. So as the UDRP quickly developed from an unknown to a known quantity in, in the late 90s, the early 2000s, CCTLDs began adopting it as, as a best practice. So this is just um, um, an informational slide, and, and I should mention that all of the statistics that are on our slides are we make available on our public website. Uh, there's quite a robust search tool. You can look not only at CCTLD cases, GTLD cases, uh, party identity, party location. There's all sorts of uh, interesting t statistics on our website. But this just shows you that in the early days, uh, once people understood what the UDRP and what the UDRP model was in CCTLD cases, there's been, as you can see, from about 2008, a rather steady uh, number of cases filed with the WIPO Center. And as specifically looking into uh, 2015, we have the, as of uh, November of this year, that's the total uh, number of uh, cases filed with our top five CCTLDs. And as you can see, in the case of Dot .nl, they are regularly the number one CCTLD 
um, um, when it comes to the cases filed with the center, they represent the, the highest uh, numbers of cases administered. And, and I should say, it says here on the slide, top five CCTLDs. And of course, this is in terms of dispute numbers, in terms of cases filed with WIPO. Um, but of course, the services that we provide are conducted strictly on a not-for-profit basis. We don't actually want there to be more cases. We're, we're simply there uh, to provide the service if they come up, and, and of course they do. And I think with uh, new GTLDs coming and with increased registration numbers generally, uh, it's a trend that's likely con to continue, but it's, it's just to situate that a little bit, it's, it's when we talk about case numbers, it's, it's not something that we strive for more cases, uh, but, but we're there to provide the services when they do arise. This is a screenshot of our what we call our CCTLD database. This is information if, if you're either a registrant or a registry who wants to know uh, what the dispute resolution policy, what the registration agreement is in a particular CCTLD. This is a comprehensive uh, resource for all CCTLDs globally. And this, this can show you, if you're a registrant, what the dispute policies are, if you're a registry, what other CCTLDs, CCTLDs are doing in terms of dispute resolution policy. So this is all CCTLDs globally. And then we also have another web page which relates to the CCTLDs for which the center provides services. Currently, that number stands at 71. And on that page, you will have uh, each CCTLD has its own page. And on it, you can, fi you can find model pleadings, uh, model complaint, model response. In addition to that, you'll be able to well, identify what type of policy that CCTLD has adopted. And in addition to that, you, of course, you will find all the decisions that have been uh, all the decisions for those cases, which are, of course, all posted online. And the decisions are posted online. We also, within our, our search function on our database, we have uh, a, a keyword legal index. We have a search function within uh, on our website where you can search for particular keywords and elect a certain CCTLD. So if you want to see cases that have been decided under a particular policy and, and look for keywords or parties where they're similarly situated, you can, you can do that as well. So moving to the CCTLD registration models, I think probably people are, are well aware by now that there's been a trend over recent years to move to a more open model. Uh, .co made a lot of fanfare a couple of years ago when they moved from uh, a registry model that was really focused on the Colombian uh, internet user to something that was really intending to compete with .com as a more open registry. And then, of course, you see uh, .me or .tv. Here we have .is. Um, so CCTLDs, which are making kind of a play on, on a particular word um, to market those to a more global audience as opposed to a specific local audience. Um, of course, and, and, and also speaking of Colombia, because that's a good example of how when a CCTLE opens up basically to the world, like in the case of Colombia, they had 28,000 registrations, and previously each year we would have one case a year. It went from, I think in just over a year, from 28,000 to over a million, and the total number of, of cases uh, f for the next two to three years went up from one to... 60, 70 uh, a year. So obviously that ha the impact of registrations worldwide had an impact on cases filed with us. And so we'll, we'll discuss some of the rights protection models that CCTLD registries have adopted. A lot of them you'll see have adopted the UDRP. Um, it's, it's simply, I think, out of efficiency. It's a, it's a known quantity. It can be plugged in. There's no adjustment needed uh, to, to the registration agreement. Usually, registrants and trademark owners know how to use it. Uh, it, it plugs in seamlessly with our, with our procedures. Uh, a number, however, do adopt variants on the UDRP, and we'll discuss some of the, some of the specific tailoring that is done. And a number have, and this stems sometimes from local legislation or maybe misunderstandings of how dispute resolution processes work outside of the courts, but some CCTLDs prefer a more traditional arbitration model. Yeah, and, and as Brian was telling us before, um, of the 71 CCTLDs that, for which we provide services, 
most of them, 43% have adopted the UDRP. And I think, well, for, there are various reasons for that. A lot of them are, are very small. They don't have the capability, you know, the human resources or, you know, technical capacity. And so they just decide to adopt a mechanism just as simple to incorporate into their registration agreement. But over time, and I think we, we started seeing this in, in the mid 2000s, where CCTLE slowly but surely started to find that, you know, well, they have uh, an important CCTLD. They also want to have a policy, and therefore, they didn't just want to adopt the UDRP, but they wanted something that uh, would incorporate some of their local needs or or characteristics. And so they would uh, end up ap um, adopting policies that were inspired, or sometimes um, actually their, the similarities might not actually be that much. So just to look at some of the cases that were filed with WIPO in 2015, you see a lot of times these are corresponding to famous brands. They're either the exact match of the brand name or the, the brand name plus a keyword. Uh, and one of the useful things to know is that for UDRP, for CCTLDs that have adopted the UDRP wholesale, um, it's possible to file, if you're a representative or a rights owner, to file a case with WIPO where there's both a GTLD, so it could be nikemania.co and nikemania.com filed in the same consolidated case. So obviously that has a certain economy for, for filing parties and, and for registrants as well because they don't have to defend uh, multiple cases on multiple fronts. The B.MW case is, is interesting to note. This was uh, filed just this year by, obviously, BMW, the, the famous car manufacturer. And in this case, this registrant had owned a, quite a portfolio of single and double-digit domain names in the .MW space. And the thing that really was the nail in the coffin for this registrant was uh, BMW looked at the portfolio and looked at the names that were for sale. Most of them were for sale for a few hundred or, or in some cases a few thousand dollars, but lo and behold, the, the B.MW domain name was for sale for a million dollars. So that was sufficient for the panelist in this case to find that this registrant wasn't simply registering a portfolio of single and double digit names for the purpose of, of holding these names and selling them in, in a fair market way, but in the case of B.MW, the registrant was actually unfairly targeting the car brand by holding out for a, a disproportionately high sum versus some of the other names in his portfolio. And now, um, if, if we look in addition to those CCTLDs that have adopted the UDRP, uh, 24 have adopted uh, variations of the UDRP. I think to, to give an example of sometimes what how this can come about as to why a CCTLD will decide to go with a variation of the UDRP or mediation or arbitration, such as in the case of Poland. Um, sometimes they, you know, a registry, for example, could call us and we'll discuss with them what it is that they need. And in the case of a Central American CCTLD, they, when they came to WIPO, when they called WIPO, they had a, p a pretty clear idea that they wanted the UDRP. But as we started going through the very specifics of the UDRP, they realized that the mutual jurisdiction was not something that they would feel comfortable with. They were not aware of the mutual jurisdiction. They were not aware that if a panel were to render a decision transferring the domain name and the registrant happened to be located in China, as in this, this case of the Central American country, they were opening up their space so that could very well be the case that the case might end up in a court in China. When they were told that the courts in China might be deciding the fate of the CCTLD, that registry immediately realized that, well, they wanted the UDP, but actually what they wanted was a variation of the UDP. And that's where WIPO comes in and helps them identify their needs. And that's what has happened with a lot of those CCTLDs that you see on that slide. Uh, for example, Qatar was the same thing. Uh, in the case of the United Arab Emirates, we also worked with them w on incorporating the, UDR uh, the variation of the UDRP to the IDN of uh, .ae. So um, what we do basically is to adapt whatever, adapt the model that they want 
If they want the UDAP, adapt the UDAP to the model that they want. And if not, um, if they want a completely uh, tailored mechanism, we can do that as well. But I think most of the time, a CCTLD will want to adopt a mechanism that is as similar to the UDAP as possible, simply because of the amount of decisions that have been rendered, the amount of jurisprudence that is available. And so um, for predictability, also for their clients, a lot of the times, you know, sometimes the, you would have uh, an, the case of another Central American CCTLD, they would register the domain names themselves. And a lot of the times, big companies would call them and say, this domain name is being used in this fashion. Would you do something about it? And in the early days, they would feel relatively comfortable to basically pull the plug, you know, take away that domain name from that registrant and give it to the company. But over time, they started realizing that, well, are we supposed to be doing this? And so then they realized they, they should have a dispute policy. When in some cases, they have to do it because of the free, free trade agreement might actually force them to, to have adopt a mechanism, which in the case of a lot of countries in Latin America, they did and they have. So Francisco mentioned the mutual jurisdiction is one of the attributes of the UDRP that's often tailored by CCTLD registries. And what the mutual jurisdiction clause is in the UDRP, there's no formal appeal mechanism. When a case comes to WIPO, we appoint an external expert who decides the fate of that registration, and that's the end of the case. But if the registrant's unhappy with that decision, they can appeal that decision and, and I'm, I'm using air quotes in, under the term appeal, um, to a local court, which is either the court of the registrant or the court where the registrar is located. So that's, that's one of the most typical adaptations of the UDRP for CCTLDs. Some of the other things that are typically varied would be the scope of rights protected. So for example, under uh, .au, not only are trademarks protected, but local business identifiers, personal names, things that are protected under Australian law are protected that go beyond the scope of the UDRP, which is limited strictly to trademarks. The UDRP doesn't protect personal names unless they're actually registered as trademarks or if the person has uh, acquired common law trademark rights and some quite uh, well-known business people have lost UDRP cases because the expert found that they didn't have standing, they didn't have trademark rights in their name as an identifier for goods or services in commerce. So oftentimes that's one of the things that when UDRP variants are being discussed, CCTLDs look at accommodating local rights. Um, another infringement of national IP laws under .ch for Switzerland. Uh, there is some specific legislation that's incorporated into their UDRP variant. One of the most popular is the registration or use. So under the UDRP, it's required that the registrant both register and use the domain name in bad faith. And in some cases, a registrant who has acquired a domain name in, for example, the early 90s, may have held that domain name for speculative purposes for the past 15 years, and then a famous brand comes along. It could be Facebook or Twitter. The name was registered before this brand came along, and because there's no intent to target that non-existent brand owner at the time the domain name was registered, that's a hurdle that oftentimes uh, complainants can't overcome in the ERP cases. So to avoid that situation where a registrant happened to register a name in the past uh, quite innocently, but then a famous brand comes along and the registrant starts to take advantage of that newly famous brand, a lot of CCTLDs have changed that to a requirement that either the registration was in bad faith at the time it was registered, or if it's subsequently used in bad faith, that would be sufficient to divest that registrant of the domain name. And then finally, you see a mediation component under the .ch or the .nl policies. There's a mediation component. For .ch cases, that's managed more by the WIPO Center. We actually uh, appoint what's called a conciliator under the, the Swiss regime to hold a phone call with the parties. Uh, that expert sort of hears the parties out and, and sets the scene for them. The parties usually, with more information, decide either 
they want to continue the case or uh, they, they don't have a winning case and they settle and they tell us that they've settled and, and the case goes away. Under the .nl regime, the .nl registry actually manages that process themselves. So once, uh, and, and this is mandatory in every case, so once there's a case filed, they work with the parties to see if they can't settle the dispute. If they can't, it comes back to us, we appoint an expert, and then a decision is taken on the case. Other ways in which CCTLEs can adopt the mechanism, um, if it's uh, inspired under the, you know, under the, uh, the UDRP or other mechanisms, would, could relate to the numbers of experts that would decide the case. In the case, of, for example, in the case of Spain, they don't have the option of three member panels. They've decided that a single member panel is enough. Um, you could also have uh, a requirement that the, pa the panelist, the expert appointed, be familiar with the laws of that jurisdiction, whether for reasons of the, the scope of the policy uh, relates to trademarks registering that country, for example, or other identifiers, such as the case of, uh, well, .ch in case of infringement uh, of Swiss law. In the case of .br, there's a requirement of knowledge of uh, Brazilian law, and in the case of Spain, the identifiers need to be protected in Spain. But um, other uh, variations to the policy might relate to a language aspect. For example, in the case of Spain, it's in Spanish, in the case of .br, it's in Portuguese, etc. And then uh, another possibility is for the CCTLD to have, in addition to the WIPO Center as a provider, to have local providers, such as in the case of Spain, or in the case of Brazil, there are two local providers in Brazil, and we are the um, the international provider. But for the and in the case of Australia, is also an example. Local providers in Australia, we are the what you could call the international provider. And and then another variant is, for example, under the .pl scheme for Poland, uh, only for cases involving foreign parties will a case come to the WIPO Center. If there's a case involving two Polish parties that's managed by a different dispute resolution provider. This is just an example of some of the cases uh, that have been filed in 2015 with the WIPO Center under UDRP variants. So again, you see in terms of the types of cases themselves, the names that are being um, chased after by brand owners don't vary really from the cases that are filed under the UDRP model in CCTLD cases. And finally, um, as Brian was mentioning before, a lot of it, if not most of the information that uh, of what we've been saying is actually provided on our website. Uh, we have available an, an overview on past decisions on selected, is selected issues, topics uh, by panelists where, where uh, panels have found that there is a consensus on a specific issue, and uh, in addition to that, you'll find information, general information, not only on the sections work, but also the other sections at the center. And, and if you have any other questions, of course, you can uh, write to us to that email address, or if not, to our personal email addresses. If anybody's interested, we have our business card. So. And I think just to just to reiterate something Francisco said is this this WIPO jurisprudential overview, um, whether for filing parties, for defending parties, for registries, uh, this is really an invaluable tool. It's it's sort of a practitioner's bible, if you will. It's about 50 of the most frequently addressed, uh, mostly substantive and some some um, procedural questions, but this really covers. 90% of the scenarios that arise in cases, uh, if, if you're either bringing a case, defending a case, thinking about um, a UDRP variant for a CCTLD space, this is really uh, a tool that, that I couldn't recommend enough. And, and then finally, um, just like we said in the beginning, really fundamentally, we do the services that we provide as a service to our member states, to, to registries, to registrars. Uh, we do this completely on a not-for-profit basis. We do it because we think there's value in providing a way of addressing disputes outside of the courts. Uh, it, it would be foolish to think that disputes aren't going to arise. Of course they are. And when they do, we think this is a useful tool for people to be able to turn to. So that's all we had. I don't know if there are any questions. Let's see. Is there anyone? Yes, here?
I would like to know the size of your organization. Well, WIPO as an organization is about 1,200 employees. The Arbitration and Mediation Center is about 40, and we have in our section about 25 employees. Um, there's 17 case managers who are usually young attorneys. Then we have, um, uh, we have several supervisors, of which Francisco is one of, so we have the case managers administering the cases on a day-to-day -day basis, and then supervisors assisting them when either procedural or other questions come up in the cases. So that's for, for usually about shy of 3,000 cases. We have 25 people managing that caseload. Thank you. What about the cost of the service? So typically a UDRP case costs 1500 US dollars to file with us and we retain $500 of that for our administrative services and 1000 of that actually goes to the external expert who decides the case. Um, we, like I mentioned, we do this on a not-for-profit basis so even with that $500 that we take in we're not able to completely cover our costs but because we are part of an intergovernmental organization, which is part of the UN family, uh, we're sort of subsidized, if you will, for this service because, like I said, we think it's useful to have even if we're not doing it on a for-profit basis. Thanks. So do we have any more questions? Uh, hello, um, I represent the, the dot is and come from Iceland and, and where I come from, you wouldn't be known as a friend of a domain holder. You, I guess you have heard that before. Has that changed? Well, I, I think it depends on, on how you look at this. Of course, we're, we're very well aware that in, in some circles we're, we're not uh, very popular because we're seen as a body that takes domain name registrations from registrants. Uh, of course, we don't actually take the decisions ourselves. We, we outsource that to uh, trademark experts around the world. Uh, we have a roster of panelists, about 500 panelists from almost every country in the world. These are some of the most respected uh, attorneys globally in this area. Um, I think why we say that we, we are, if you will, friends of the registrants is because uh, in the UDRP there's no damages available to brand owners. And that's one of the complaints, frankly. Uh, right now, I don't know if everyone knows, ICANN, the organization that sort of oversees the, the internet naming structure, is conducting a review of rights protection mechanisms such as the UDRP. And we're aware that one of the requests from the brand owner community is that the UDRP actually takes on a monetary sanction, a penalty, because um, with no disincentive against registering future infringing names, it's sort of a whack-a-mole from the brand owner perspective. So we see, on the one hand, of course, how the, the UDRP decisions are taking a registration from someone. Um, that's based on, on case law that's been developed over 15 years. It's a, it's a fairly stable system. Um, it's, there's been jurisprudence that's developed around this, so it's a, it's a fairly known quantity. And I think you can, you can look at the list of cases that's filed with us every day and with 99% with accuracy uh, see which way the case is going to go to see if this is a good faith registration or not. Um, a lot of cases where there's generic terms or free speech issues, these cases are denied regularly. So uh, there's a lot of registrant protections built into the UDRP both in the policy itself and in, in the case law that's developed around that. So we think in that respect where there's um, safe harbors for registrants and no monetary penalties, it actually does provide a service to registrants where they're not facing monetary sanctions uh, in court. And, and just picking up on that, I think also you, you see it a bit with, uh, as respondents also, and respondents' counsel have become more sophisticated when you look at 15 years ago, whether it's you know, compared to today, and you see some representatives who are very, very much uh, into the UDRP and very, very knowledgeable on the UDRP, you see them participating, for example, to the workshops that we do. And they are, and whereas 10, maybe 10, 15 years ago, they were doubting whether 
a WIPO panelist, even though those are, you know, panelists that are independent, you know, th they would question whether a panelist would actually deny the case because, it, you know, they believe that maybe the panelist wouldn't simply because, you know, th they, the panelist would side with the trademark owner. You see those uh, same, you know, representatives actually in cases, for example, of three-member panels, selecting WIPO panelists. And so, because I think um, over time they realized that while of course there may be controversial cases out there, the clear-cut cases where the case should be denied, at least speaking of the white blue cases, most likely that will be the outcome. Yeah, and of course we know from speaking with, with counsel for registrants that they, they know which cases to defend, which cases not to defend. Um, and of course, like I mentioned earlier, there's the mutual jurisdiction clause which provides a safety valve if there's, uh, you know, if there's some real heartburn with a decision from a WIPO panelist, that doesn't stop the registrant from taking that to a local court. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? So just out of curiosity, how many cases are appealed to national court? Do you know that? We don't have a, a raw figure. It's, it's, it's very, very unusual. Uh, we have listed on our web page, uh, I want to say maybe less than 40. Of course, we're not aware of every case that's appealed. Um, but out of, out of over 50,000 cases, uh, it's, it's double digits. And, uh, and, and in some cases, that's because there's a legitimate appeal and in other cases, we know that there are jurisdictions that um, don't recognize the cause of actions for cyber squatting. So some registrants will register names with registrars in certain jurisdictions, uh, knowing that if there's a UDRP case brought against them, they can appeal it to a local court who will basically throw the case out, either because they don't recognize a cause of action under local law or in other jurisdictions because the court processes uh, take years and years. And, and we've been, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years and, and we see tens of thousands of emails on occasion where accidentally copied on, on an email that's not meant for us. And, and we've seen cases where registrants or registrants counsel will, um, will quite boldly say, you know, they'll threaten the trademark owner to say, we're gonna demand this much money out of you and if you uh, continue with the UDRP case, we'll just appeal it to a court in this jurisdiction where it will drag on for four years and we'll make your life miserable. So that's a long-winded way of saying very, very few cases are actually appealed to courts and of the ones that are, there are some that are legitimately appealed and some for reasons to, to frustrate the purpose after the fact. <laughs> So just, sorry, just a follow-up question. Um, so if there is a settlement agreement, say, eight years down the road, uh, is the registrar still obliged to actually implement the decision, the UDRP decision, or is it between the... Well, we've the actually had a case where it went to court, and I think four years later, they, the court informed the registrar, and the registrar implemented it because it, it was, the registrar was still the registrar. Well, okay, yeah. thank you. So... Thank you so much for uh, presenting this interesting. Uh, I think it really worked with having you two guys, uh, speakers on the stage at the same time. We'll have time. to try it again. Maybe. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank Give you. Give them an applaud.